Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. The interview series, Reflections in Time, was begun by the late Professor Paul Borgi more than 20 years ago. This new series continues Paul's work and is dedicated to his memory. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960, and I served for 20 years as dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgi in the development of his original interview series, and I can think of no more fitting tribute to him than to continue this work. Good afternoon. It's a very pleasant afternoon here in uh, late January, 19, or 19, yes, 2001. And um, typical January day, a little chilly out. We had a little snow this morning. I have as my guest uh, Tom Gutierrez, who is uh, <laughs> Dean of International Studies and program at Programs at UN Omaha, and also at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, Tom came to Omaha in 1974. I remember it very well. Welcome, Tom. I'm glad to have you here as my guest. I remember we both kind of came into uh, new positions both at the same time. Both started new jobs. On yes, the same day. First day of August. Right. 1974, you became Dean of Arts and Sciences, and I came here to be the, the Dean of International Studies and Pro uh, International Affairs, it was called at the time, and the Director of the Center for Afghanistan Studies. Yeah. Um, I, well, even, I even stole your chair, if you remember, Jack. <laughs> you, you were getting a new one, and I took your whole chair from, uh, from your office yeah. there. So <laughs> well, We'll get a, uh, get a chance to talk about those days a little bit, but let's, uh, let's begin by talking a little about you. Uh, I, uh, I know a little bit about your history, but our audience doesn't. I, uh, so tell us all about Maumee, Ohio. Yeah, right. and, uh, You've had to listen to, to these <laughs> stories a lot, right? Well, uh, <laughs> I tell this story also to my, to my students in International Studies uh, 213 Introduction to International Studies, primarily because I, I, I like to set the stage for sh suggesting to them that if they think that they um, might not have a, all the credentials or background to lead them into some kind of international career, international experience, my, my own particular background would, would have suggested that about me, that um, my family, having come from Belgium, was involved in, in glass working when they came to the United States, went into pastry baking. My grandfather had a, a, a bakery in Maumee, and during the war, he had to close it down because he couldn't get sugar and eggs and stuff like that. And after the war, my father restarted the bakery. My grandfather came to work for him, just as my dad had worked for his his own father. And then, uh, at eight years old, I started to work in the bakery myself. 1948, I was in the third grade, I think, and um, I uh, uh, was, uh, you know, washing pots and pans. Eventually, I worked. Uh, 10 years as an apprentice and I became a master pastry chef at 18, the same year that I graduated from high school. So you had something to fall back on. I if certainly you, uh, did. Right. <laughs> other careers didn't, uh, didn't And, and work I really out. enjoyed that work and, and uh, I, I particularly enjoyed the opportunity to work within the family structure. I worked there throughout all those years with my grandfather and my father. At one time, my uncle was also working with us. My brothers and sister also were there. My mother, of course. And um, so I eventually became the primary uh, pastry finisher in the bakery, doing all the decorating and and making you know the uh, kind of uh, final pieces that put everything together. And it was a great great experience. So still I, do any of that? I still do a lot of cooking, and I still do some baking. And I'm going to 
I decorated Del Weber's daughter's uh, wedding cake, and I'm going to decorate my own son's wedding cake this coming May when he gets married. So, uh, so, but I, but mostly I do cooking now. I just love to to do cooking, and so my I I had not had much of a chance to to do anything that would have suggested that I was, you know, a, a well-traveled lad. I wasn't at all. And I was probably more in love with the idea of being a baseball player at that time than anything else, although I was always fascinated by my family's origins. And my, I had grandparents who liked to tell stories, and, and I was uh, uh, probably a little strange because I used to like to sit around and listen to them all the time, and I did. And, uh, and so I was fascinated by those Belgian backgrounds. And so by the time I was in high school, I was thinking it'd be nice if I could kind of travel abroad, study abroad. But I never um, really found a, a venue or an avenue or a means to do that. And, um, and while I was in college, I tried for a couple of scholarship programs, and I was runner-up. Unfortunately, nobody bumped off the winners, <laughs> so I was, wasn't able to, to go abroad. So but where did you go to college? Well, I went to Bowling Green. I was going to come to that, Jack. Okay. But nice of you to, to tr bring <laughs> it back in there. Uh, and that, I think, is kind of an interesting thing. The university I attended, Bowling Green State University, was located 13 miles from my hometown. I never saw that campus until I went there for my freshman orientation, which would suggest that I really wasn't very well traveled at all. And I wasn't. And. Um, but I went there and really enjoyed that uh, education that I got there. How did there. you pick Bowling Green? Was it just because it was close? Or? Well, for, for reasons that are quite similar to the reasons that many students choose UNO. I think mm -hmm. the, the cost, the convenience, the ability to stay close to home. I worked in the bakery, so I, would, I had dreamed of going to Notre Dame or Marquette or the University of Detroit and had applied to those institutions. Um, and might have gone there, but I, it was it was a fiscal ne mm -hmm. necessity. I needed to be at uh, sure. at um, uh, at the bakery where I I knew I had a job full time, and I worked full time throughout those years, uh, both undergraduate and graduate. I I used to average about 60 hours a week because in a bakery you go in real early in the morning, you work to noon, then I used to come down and do all my classes in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Unlike what a lot of students do now, they yes. they work. In, I mean, they go to school in the morning, they go out and work in the afternoon. Fridays, I would go three in the morning to noon, go to classes, come home by five, take two hours of of, of, of a nap. By 7:30 that same night, it was back at the bakery, and I would work until noon the next day. And uh, uh, so it was a busy time, but I mean, it, it was a devotion as well. I mean, it was a a labor of love. I, I really enjoyed that opportunity to work with my family in that. Well, uh, Bowling Green didn't used to be a familiar name to people in Omaha, but it is now since uh, they have become one of our C uh, C -C big opponents in the, right. uh, in the hockey uh, league. That's right. right. And I do cheer for our UNO in those, in those <laughs> okay. matches. Uh, I get ribbed about the fact that I... Uh, cheer for Notre Dame in the <laughs> football and in this state of course that's a kind of dangerous uh, occupation but uh, uh, but anyhow from while I was there at Boeing Green I, I it was during the time that uh, John Kennedy uh, uh, was running for president and he made his Peace Corps speech in Ann Arbor Michigan and repeated it later uh, ideas relating to that in Toledo itself so they have a Miami. brass plaque on the steps of the Student Union in Ann Arbor where, um, where he made that speech. Oh, is that right? You know, I've never seen that, but I, but I followed my, my it. Son, my son went there, oh, went that right? to U of oh, M, so all I... Right. Well, that's neat to know that. But I do remember that speech, mm -hmm. and it was, of course, a famous speech of his, and it kind of gave me the idea that if I, you know, nobody would bump off these other guys who were the first, you know, people <laughs> on, the, uh, on the selection <laughs> uh, panels there, then... Uh, then there was another chance. And, and in, in fact, that's what happened. Um, well, what did you major in when you were at Bowling Green? I was uh, in history and foreign languages. Okay. I took as many foreign languages as I could, a little bit of them, of each of them, you know? And uh, I guess you, people might consider me to be a kind of a dilettante, but I took Latin, French, Russian, Spanish, German, 
those are the ones I mm -hmm. did there. Then later on, I did some others in graduate school. But you never had any Persian language as an undergraduate? No, uh, no Persian, no Arabic until mm -hmm. later. Well, well, we'll come to that, too. This is good. <laughs> Pretty quick, I guess, because yeah. uh, we, uh, you went from, uh, uh, went from Bowling Green. Did you go directly to uh, graduate school? No, well, I went directly to graduate school at Bowling Green in history again. Mm -hmm. And while I was there doing that, um, I made plans for marriage, and my fiance and I, Mary Lou, uh, you know, registered for the Peace Corps, signed up for the Peace Corps, and as, as what is called the engaged couples uh, signing up. And so we did that, and we were accepted. Uh, we found out while we were on our honeymoon in Washington, D.C., and uh, we had applied for Iran, Turkey, in any place but Latin America. And we did that because I was interested in the Middle East, mm -hmm. the, the ancient Near East from my studies. I didn't want to go to some place that was too hot, so I didn't choose like India. I didn't want to go in the Western Hemisphere, therefore that's why not uh, Latin America. And of course, as with anything relating to the government, I wound up not getting any of those <laughs> in any case, and I wound up in uh, Afghanistan, which was surely, you know, any, th any place but Latin America. But it was the greatest break of my life that we wound up there. And uh, uh, that was my, v when I went to the Peace Corps, I had my very first plane trip and my very first uh, visit to another country. So, uh, again, as I suggest to my students, not a career that, uh, would suggest itself at least uh, moving along international paths till at up to that point uh, when you uh, I presume that you had some language training before you got to Afghanistan in the uh, we, we uh, every Peace Corps volunteer went to a at that time three month long training program and uh, the focus of those training programs were language and culture and then preparation in a professional, you sure. know, activity. And for me, it was intensive English. I was to be teaching intensive mm -hmm. English and to coach some basketball because I did some of that. While I was in graduate school at uh, Boeing Green, I was coaching a grade school basketball team and uh, uh, also did a little bit of that at a high school at which I was teaching Latin mm -hmm. uh, just before we went off to the Peace Corps. So. That gave us the, the, you know, gave me some skills that, that the Peace Corps thought was, mark, was marketable. And so I was trained, uh, you know, for that. But then we did a lot of, you know, you'd spend eight hours in studying Dari or Persian. Hey, why, why, don't we, um, why don't you explain to me uh, about the languages of Afghanistan? Well, maybe I should just, you know, I, ask I, you a few <laughs> questions in Dari, Jack, because... For those of you who don't know this, of course, Jack was my student That's when I right. first came here. You and <laughs> and about ten others. Uh, I, I decided it would be a good idea to learn to speak a little Dari. That's right, and you did, and you were a good student, by the way, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. You still can use it some of it, so uh, I, I, I've seen you. But um, uh, the language itself is one of the uh, dialects of the Persian language mm -hmm. family, uh, which is spoken in... Iran and Afghanistan and Tajikistan, and uh, at one time it was a language that swept from you know the Mediterranean to the Bay of Bengal. It was the primary court language of the Mughals and the Ottoman Turks, even though it wasn't their mother's tongues. Mm -hmm. And um, so it, it it's a language of great poetic expression, and I really had a great great time with it. I really learned how to speak that language. It was the only language up to that point, although I took all those in college and high school, mm -hmm. Latin and French and Russian, etc. And but I never really learned how to speak them. I you know, everything was directed more towards learning grammar and being able to read this and stuff like that. And uh, but not Peace Corps. And Peace Corps language training was conversational communication. That was the primary focus. So um, and that really kind of engendered within me a tremendous uh, affinity for that part of the world as well. The culture was very seductive. The people were very, very hospitable. And so when I came back from two years in the Peace Corps, we went to uh, Indiana University to graduate school where I was going to 
originally uh, get a degree in political science, but after I was there for a little bit, I decided I wanted to go, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in um, more along the lines of Islamic studies mm -hmm. and uh, Near Eastern languages and literatures, and so I, I focused on that. Just to tie up what we started talking about, so... Uh, tie up, Jack? We never do that, do we? Persian <laughs> is a generic term here, right? Uh -huh. And then uh, Dari... Dari is in is Afghanistan, Tajiki in, in uh, and Tajikistan, and Farsi in Iran, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Good point, Jack. Good, got that All right, I got but, uh, but Dari is not the only language spoken in No, it's not. There are other languages spoken in Afghanistan, Pashto and Uzbeki and Turkmeni and... Um, Baluchi and mm -hmm. a couple of other little uh, small language groups as well, but uh, but those are the primary ones. Right. And uh, so uh, I did teach uh, English as a second language, and I did coach uh, a high school basketball team and the national team of Afghanistan while I was there as a Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. Mary Lou taught business education, and she also did some coaching because she was a relatively good athlete. Were you a good coach? Yeah, I was a good what coach. What was your win-loss record? Uh, well, I came back to Afghanistan, <laughs> and I continued to coach. And over the 10-year uh, period, the official one-loss record is uh, 105 and 6. So I remembered that, Jack. <laughs> uh, in fact, you know, I think you've heard me tell this story. We, in 1970, when I was there, again, as the, then the, uh, as a Fulbright fellow, uh, Fulbright fellow, I coached the national team to a great victory over the team, a visiting team from the People's Republic of China. Mm -hmm. They had a couple of seven-foot players. We didn't, but they came from uh, sea level. We were at 6,000 feet, and so we... And that helped your class just Well, because we, we pressed them man-to-man <laughs> -man in zone throughout the game, and we ran on them throughout. And um, we, uh, the Chinese weren't pleased to have an American uh, coach. Uh, they uh, felt that... Uh, uh, this was before detente, you know, mm -hmm. so they felt that they were there to play the Afghans, and so they asked that I be removed. And the Afghans said they would not continue to play unless I could continue to coach. And so I said, in order to be able to get this game going, I'll sit in the stands and I'll, I'll send one of our players down with instructions. So I just sat a few rows back, and we did it that way. We were ahead at halftime. Uh, 39 to 38 to 19, and we won 58 to 39. So that was a great triumph. Students put me on their shoulders, marched me around the stadium. We received a trophy from the king. People were chanting, "Mr. Tom, Mr. Tom," <laughs> and I tell everybody, life has been downhill ever since. So, uh, but it was a great, a great thing. I mean, the Afghans loved it. I loved it. It was a way for me to get to know Afghans very well. Many of those same. Individuals, ball players, and students I taught in, uh, you know, while I was in the Peace Corps, individuals I sent abroad uh, when I was head of the Fulbright Foundation. Uh, these are individuals who are later very prominent in the war against the Soviet Union. Some of them were fighting on the side of the Soviet Union, or at least a part of that. Dr. Najibullah was a student of mine when I was a Peace Corps volunteer at uh, Habibia High School. But at the same time, Sons of the King were also my students, and Many of the individuals who were later uh, commanders and uh, freedom fighters against the Soviet Union were were also students. So, mm. but we've kind of leapt ahead here. I've yeah. Well, uh, um, you started in the Peace Corps right uh, shortly after you graduated. From well, right when college. I was finishing well, up right a graduate finished, program yes. at at Boeing Green. Right. So, and we signed up in 1964, and we arrived in Afghanistan in 65. And you stayed there in the Peace Corps until? Until March of 67. Okay. Came back, then went to uh, do a little Peace Corps training program as, mm -hmm. as employees of the Peace Corps to train new people to do that. We, that training project was in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Went for three months during the summer, and from there I went to Indiana University where I had applied and been accepted to, to do this program, and I focused on Persian language, uh, Arabic some, and also Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Persian Gulf history and politics. Now, what led you to Indiana University? Uh, it was uh, one among a handful of, stu mm -hmm. of institutions to which I applied, and the one that uh, just kind of appealed to me more. I just liked the, the sound of their program as it was. They had 
a little more in the way of Persian than some of the others. And um, I guess maybe it's closer to Ohio, you know, who sure. knows? I can't remember all the reasons why I selected them, but we had a, I had applied to Brandeis and Princeton and Indiana, Michigan. Michigan actually was closer than Indiana, but just kind of, it just had an appeal sure. to me. And um, so, and I was very pleased that I made that choice. It was a wonderful place to go uh, to, to study. And they had some good instructors in, in the Middle Eastern studies that I was seeking to follow. And while I was there, great break for me, I applied for a Fulbright Fellowship to go to Afghanistan, to return to Afghanistan. And this time, you know, I wasn't an alternate. I, I was selected and uh, wound up uh, going back there shortly. You know, we'd only been in the United States really not even, just about two years. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Afghanistan parts of 67 and also we returned then in 69 with this fellowship. So, so you earned a master's degree at Indiana. That's right. And I was doing uh, my, you know, doctoral program and had taken the courses and everything mm -hmm. leading towards that. And I was going off and was going to do my research, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, my research was to be on um, the first newspaper published in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I did, did that stuff. And, but I also focused a lot on poetry because that was something that kind of fascinated sure. me, Persian poetry. And uh, so I studied a lot about the Afghan poets in, in Persian language while I was in Afghanistan. And while I was there, I started to write poetry and wound up uh, publishing a little collection of Persian poets po poems that I wrote. And uh, these were sold in bookstores and, mm. and by, you know, by the university. It was done by the University of, of uh, Kabul University's College of, uh, of Letters and Humanities. Mm. Uh, they, have a, they had a journal. and. Uh, they published a couple of my poems, and then they did the collection of poems that I and did. You did some translations too, didn't you? Yes, I did. I did yeah. some translations of other. Why poems. Why is it that uh, Persian seems to lend itself so well to poetry? Is it? A I think because it, it's a it's a a language that has a very very rhythmic mm -hmm. uh, sound to it in and of uh, in and of itself. It also has a a. Um, I would call it a poetic sound, a, a musical sound in, in terms of the vowel consonant, vowel consonant arrangements with the long vowels. We have none in English unless we, you know, modify them in some way, but in Persian that's not the case. And also uh, there's, a, there's a beauty about the language in terms of the way letters relate, I mean words relate to environment. Mm -hmm. The word for water, as you know, is ob, you know, and the word for blue, like your coat today is, as you know, you remember, Jack? Aw, be. Aw, be, right. Yeah, right. And so, it, you know, these, all these things kind of relate. And, and it's kind of fun to, for poetic expression. And it's also a language that lends itself great, in a great way to humor and to the use of puns. And uh, so I just found, you know, it, it very, very entertaining just to be studying that language. And, and written in the um, Arabic, Arabic script, script. It, it's very pretty to look at. That's so. right, I think so. And that's a, a kind of a unique thing about it. It's an Indo-European language, like mm -hmm. is English and the European languages, and but it's written in a Semitic script. And uh, so, uh, and I studied Arabic so that uh, when I was in graduate school at Indiana, so that helped me to substantiate my mm -hmm. you know, feeling with the with the use of the of the of, the, of, the, of that script so you you never did uh, finish that doctoral degree never did though, do that Indiana, no. but nope. you've had honorary doctorates along the yes, way yes i have and One from the uh, um, university of the university city of, of manila, city of manila in, and uh, also in, tajikistan in, uh, yeah T technological university of tajikistan i remember so you and I share something. We both have honorary doctorates from the Technological University, University of Tajikistan. Tajikistan. Right. That's right. That's nice. Yeah. And I remember when I came here uh, to take on the job uh, that I did, uh, Herb Garfinkel, a man who I dearly love to this day, he's 80 years old now and was a very, very excellent uh, provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. And he counseled me, you know, that he thought I should go back and get my 
finish my Ph.D. And I, I had a long discussion with him. I told him, uh, I remember this, this, this phraseology uh, very, very distinctly. I said, you know, Herb, and by this time we had gotten to be comfortable with each other, not just as boss and employee. And I said, you know, I came here and I really want to do this managerial mm -hmm. task here. I think this is a real challenge. I said, if I go back and start spending time either in the summer or in the evenings, I'm not going to be doing this. I have to travel a lot. My schedule's very incomplete. I said, you hired me based on my cr current credentials. And if you don't think I'm doing the job, I said, I just want you to fire my ass. <laughs> I remember telling him that, you know. And he laughed, and I laughed, and that's that's essentially where we got that. You know, I, I did not seek uh, tenure, mm -hmm. and I don't have that to this day. I um, uh, and uh, although I've taught in the mm -hmm. Department of Foreign Languages, and I now teach regularly the introductory course for international studies. So, uh, but uh, it just was a um, it was a kind of an inconvenient thing, and and uh, I had made the decision that I would not work in a university. Sure. Uh, when I went, when I was in Afghanistan with the Fulbright Fellowship, I was offered this position to be the director of the Fulbright Foundation. So I had to make this decision that I want to go back to graduate school, get that PhD finished, or should I take this job, you know, which was mm -hmm. more than, than most uh, university jobs were offering at that time. And I, I, I went the way with money. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so... Uh, and it was a great opportunity for me to stay on and coach the Afghan national basketball team and, 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 be, and enjoy being in the country that uh, we all enjoyed. And that's where, our, during that time, our first son was born. And well, let's, uh, let's go backtrack just a minute, okay. though, uh, because we, uh, last time we talked, you were uh, a Fulbright fellow. Right. And now you had another uh, job with the Fulbright. That's right. Uh, I was head of the Fulbright Foundation okay. there. And how did that happen? Well, uh, while I was there, um, the position was, was coming open, and a couple of the individuals who were the members of the board, uh, which included the ambassador and mm -hmm. public affairs officer, they encouraged me to consider taking it on. They had gotten to know me while I was there, uh, and I thought that was a very uh, neat idea, really, mm -hmm. And because um, it was, was a neat job. It was a job that uh, focused on uh, the direction of all educational exchanges between Afghanistan mm -hmm. and the United States, whether they be Fulbright programs or American Fields, uh, you know, s service programs, AFS, uh, East-West Center programs, there are a whole host of them. Sure. And so uh, I got to work with academicians and scholars and students at a, a whole new level. And in a sense, it was a professional, I don't know, the opening of a professional door for me. I, I, I enjoyed being doing this stuff abroad, but I didn't know exactly what would be the philosophical focus or base of that. And and what happened was that I, I liked the objectives of Fulbright, which were essentially to promote mutual understanding through the you know international educational exchange. It seemed like a very understandable, realistic, mm -hmm. and admirable uh, set of principles. And so um, that really f I found that very very you know sure. uh, professionally rewarding. So I did that for a number of years, and and then. Uh, and then got into something that started to involve me with UNO for the first time. Remember, I'd, I'd we're gonna get We're going to get you here before this program's over. Yeah, that right. <laughs> and not if we continue to digress as we are famous for doing. But, uh, yes, you're we have, famous for doing. Well, well, you're not so <laughs> infamous yourself in these areas. So <laughs> the, uh, the, um, the thing that I, that, I, uh, that I really remember about the, the UNO connection was that there was, it's, it's really incestuous for me because I went to Indiana University. It came from Indiana back to Afghanistan with the Fulbright. Indiana University had a, uh, an AID, USAID uh, grant to work at Kabul University to help that institution develop its administration mm -hmm. uh, policies and structure. So when we, when we w arrived back in Afghanistan, my wife and I, she was hired by Indiana University. And, and 
to be their office manager, you know, and she was, you know, they were pleased to have people who had come from their own institution, you mm -hmm. know, her, you know, to have her doing that, and then we had a close relationship with that team. And later on, when I was director of the Fulbright Foundation, the individual who had hired uh, Mary Lou, my wife, uh, to that position, got in touch with me. He was now back in Indiana, and he said that his son, his name was Chris Jung, and his son was also Chris Jung, was working at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, trying to establish a program relating to Afghanistan. And if I had a chance to help him out, please do so. And, you know, I thought, wow, you know, it's kind of an improbable, mm -hmm. you know, set of circumstances, but I, of course I told him I'd be most pleased to do that. Sure enough, and you know why, because you met Chris Jung, the younger. Sure, of course. They were in touch with me. He was a very dynamic kid, and a uh, man who was born the same year as was I, and uh, but who really was a, 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 an energetic guy. I, I, my my memory of him here he was 300 pounds, my height, six foot two, and he and he moved equally as fast as I did anywhere. He just and his mind was racing just as quickly. And he was dedicated as well to the idea of, of, of having UNO become a center for the study of Afghanistan. And he was dedicated to that because he had gone to Afghanistan while his father was out there, done some teaching out there, and uh, became enamored of Afghanistan like everybody does who goes there, and except for the Russians, of course. And, uh, and so he... Um, came back to Nebraska to complete his degree at UNL and then got a job here mm -hmm. and then he approached then Chancellor Ron Roskins to uh, to you know to suggest to him that UNO which had little or no international uh, you know outreach at that time might choose to develop that upon Afghanistan mm -hmm. because nobody else was willing to do that there was there there were a a number of scholars who formed an association in the United States called the Afghanistan Studies Association, and he was a member of that. They went to all these universities to try and get them to take up the, the issue of Afghanistan or the matter of yes. Afghanistan, become its home. And with that, they were going to try and bring a library that was available, they thought, and so that would be at least a contribution to that university. They went to Princeton. They went to Indiana University, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. They went to Harvard. They went to Michigan. They went to Cincinnati. They went to Purdue. All these, Wyoming, all these, Columbia University, they had a long history of working in Afghanistan on government contracts. But when the government contracts were over, so was their interest, as it turned out. And so Chris Jung the Younger said to Ron Roskins, you know, we can do this thing, you know. And he used to, and Ron likes to tell the story that Chris Jung used to corner him everywhere he could, and in the hallways of, mm -hmm. you know, Arts and Sciences, what is now Arts and Sciences Hall, then the administration building, and uh, and he finally persuaded him. And so, shortly, it was fortuitous that Ron Roskins had a an international interest. Interest, too, right? And uh, and this just happened to work out at the right he, time. He believed in in the, in the importance yeah. of internationalizing higher education, and uh, but he too didn't have a hat upon, I mean, a hook yeah. upon which to hang his hat, and so I think you know Chris Jung ha gave right. him a kind of of uh, flag to to wave, you know, and uh, and as improbable as it may seem, you know, here was this. Metropolitan University, which really wasn't quite yet that, mm -hmm. uh, and which had not had any international experience uh, to speak of, makes this decision. And so this young Chris Jung, <coughs> young Chris Jung, uh, gets in touch with me and suggests that we might want to be able to help promote exchanges between UNO and uh, Kabul University. And so I said we would, and we did were able to do that. And as you recall, Gordon Schills, then the chairman of the Department of Geography, who was going to be stepping down, uh, decided to come out to Afghanistan on a, on a, uh, on a, a small grant we were able to provide, uh, but was a Fulbright-related grant. And, and Ron Buffaro, 
who was a graduate student, came out there to do research, and we handled their programs. Mm -hmm. And we, I had uh, met, uh, well, I would met both of them before I decided I was going to come and visit UNO, and it was because their interest in, in Afghanistan and suggesting to me that when I came for a uh, kind of a, an R&R &R between mm -hmm. one of my years as the head of the Fulbright Foundation, that I stop off in Omaha. And uh, they got in touch with Chris Jung, the younger, and said, please, he said, please do come. So we came in August of 1973, just a few months really after this whole thing had been inaugurated here at UNO. So I came here and I met him, I met Roskins, met, uh, you know, uh, Bill Gaines and, uh, and Vic ba Blackwell. These were the main people, along with the person who was really uh, kind of my warmest host, and that was Dick Lane, who was then the chairman of the H English department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Vic Blackwell, who you mentioned, was dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Sciences at, at that time, time. And, and he had uh, previously been interim chancellor. Right, there, and uh, and uh, Dick Lane was his assistant dean at, uh, at that uh -huh. time, too, uh, 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 and then moved on to become Trump chair Jim, of the English right. department. That's right, and so when I, when I came here, he was that assistant right. dean, you're right. And uh, shortly after I visited here, went back to Afghanistan, uh, Chris Jung the Younger died of a rare blood disease. Very suddenly. Very suddenly. Shocked everybody. And in fact, when we heard that Chris Jung had died, we got a, a telegram. We thought that it probably meant that the elder had died. We had already had a heart attack once in his life. He's going strong still to this day. You know, he's in his probably near 80 now and uh, really in very good dynamic health. The guy exercises a lot, but his son unfortunately died in 1973. And it was through Dick Lane that UNO approached me to take this job here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I expected that when Chris Jung the Younger died that uh, this institution would probably drop, their, drop its interest in Afghanistan. I mean, I, I, I kind of considered UNO's interests improbable in and of itself. You know, I couldn't, didn't quite understand how an institution liked it, but I was pleased to be working with it. So we just kind of looked, but sure enough, you know, shortly after this man died, the university's in touch with, with me and they say, we'd like you to come and take up this position. And I, and I turned them down. Uh, I think you've heard this story. I turned them down and said, no, I, I think I'm going to uh, be the next director of the Peace Corps in Afghanistan, and I, I think I'd prefer to do that, but thank you in any case. So uh, a few weeks later, I heard that they were coming out to Afghanistan to explore the future of this uh, relationship, and, and at this time, then, Dick Lane was really carrying the lance that had fallen when Chris Jung died, and uh, he came out and he said, my major, these guys have this, to, this guy has this to do, this guy has that to do, and this guy has that to do while we're here, but my, my major objective is to come here and persuade you to be, to come to UNO and to take up this program and lead it. And I said, well, thank you, you know, it's very flattering. I said, I'm going to be going to Washington in a, in a week or so, and I'm going to be interviewing for the Peace Corps job. And I'll, I'll get back to you and tell you, you know, you know how that all works out, and uh, I'm flattered by this offer. And I came back and to Afghanistan. And, I mean, I called him from Washington, told him that I was probably going to take the Peace Corps job because I'd gone through the interviews all right and was told I was going to be offered that. So he was persistent. And I, and I, and I, I really remember this about him. You know, he would write to me and say, now, you, what you really want to do is reconsider because I think you've got a better long-term thing for your future to come here to Omaha, you know. Well, I mean, when you're in, uh, in Afghanistan and you've come from Maumee, Ohio, it doesn't sound like, you know, the most uh, likely path that one might take. But eventually, you know, I talked with the ambassador, Ted Elliott, about this offer. The last offer mm -hmm. was, we want you to come out to Omaha. We want, we're, we want you to become director of the uh, Afghanistan program. We also want you to be dean for uh, international affairs and develop uh, the whole international development of UNO. Would you consider doing it if we added mm -hmm. that dimension? Well, then I went to the 
to the ambassador and said, you know, it's kind of an interesting offer. And he said, if I were you, I'd take that job. He said, in fact, I'd take that job right now, uh, you know, and leave my position amb as ambassador if, if they would offer it to me. <laughs> and I looked if at him. If we'd known that, we probably would have hired him. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> right. I didn't tell anybody. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. So, uh, in any case, uh, so then I sent to uh, Dick Lane a cable. And I remember the, the content uh, very well. It said, I sent it to him on April 1, you know. I said, this is no April Fool's joke. I accept, uh, you know, we'll be able to start 1st of August. Great. And that's that's so now the we've got saga. you here. Now you got me here. Well, you and know, it's we been downhill we, ever since. Just <laughs> <laughs> we've we've only got an hour to talk here, so in That's the next right. 15 minutes or so, we got 15 more let's, minutes or so. Um, huh? Let's talk about what you've done since you got here. All right. Well, um, you're currently uh, uh, the dean of international studies and programs. What is a what does a dean of international studies and programs do? First of all, you got studies, right? So that must have something to do with right. students. Right. Well. You know, because you were intimately involved, Jack, and, and I appreciate the question. You know, you know <laughs> just the right things to ask, so you're appropriately the interviewer here. But when I, when I came here, you know, the, the initial thrust was really the Afghanistan program. And if you'll recall, uh, when after uh, Chris Jung died, uh, Lane and uh, a number of others started putting together proposals to get monies from aid to, you know, get involved more and more, bring more Afghans here, send more uh, we had that uh, there. We had that relationship with Kabul University, and that was one thing that happened yeah, right away. That's right. But, but even, even before that, I mean, what had happened, was, it's an interesting thing. We, <laughs> UNO, uh, with a number of other universities, were competing was competing uh, for an AID contract, mm -hmm. and that had been put together, I think, by Chris Jung. And that contract, I think they had made the decision in Afghanistan to award that contract to uh, Saint, uh, California, University of California, St. Louis Obispo, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But what happened in Afghanistan was a coup. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that coup d'etat, everything, you know, was set aside, and it was decided to start all over again. And, uh, and so I remember that was one of the things also that Dick Lane was mm -hmm. doing then when he was in uh, Afghanistan, was to uh, uh, meet with people in Afghanistan to see how sure. they might improve their previous proposal. So he came back here and started to rewrite that proposal. And it was right before I left that I found out that UNO was likely, was, was going to be awarded that contract. And, uh, and one of the reasons why uh, that choice was made was because UNO made the commitment that, that there would be an Afghanistan Studies and Research Program, whether they got the contract or not. and even after the contract was over. Mm -hmm. And I think AID, the personnel in, 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 in Kabul, I know were impressed by that because I was still mm -hmm. there then. And I was talking to people like Tony Alonzo. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they knew was that I was coming here to yeah. head up that thing. And, and the other thing that happened right at this time before, before I got here, actually, was that there was this man by the name of Arthur Paul who had been a, a world-famous uh, economist, and he worked... Uh, for the U.S. government in Afghanistan as an advisor. Mm -hmm. And he loved to collect books, and he collected the best collection of Afghanistan history and everything else that anyone knew of at that time. And, and it was kind of the famous Arthur Paul collection. And, uh, and he was kind of determining what to do with it. He was a man who was in his upper 70s by this time, and he decided that he you know, had to do it his wife, Daisy, wanted him to give it to the University of Pennsylvania because she was from the Pennsylvania Main Line. And uh, he wanted to give it to Harvard because he had some friends and, con and connections there or to Princeton where he also mm -hmm. had. But they weren't interested. And again, it was as part of this people, these people going around saying, you know, start a center for yes, Afghanistan yes. studies. And, and so Chris Jung said to me, you, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, well, he actually he had lobbied him earlier and and but at that time I don't think there was much of a chance after Chris Jung died then uh, you know I started to doing it from this direction in Afghanistan yeah. and a number of these people in the Afghanistan Studies and, and Re uh, Afghanistan Studies Association started to work on Arthur Paul and he made that decision to give it to UNO because UNO had established this center which was really an, kind of an improbable thing. I was able to bring that news with me when I came here. So we wound fortuitously, up fortuitously we just built a new library building so we had a place to put it. That's right. That's right. We were in the process right. of doing that. That's right. And uh, so something just just fell here on the floor, Jack. But in any case, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm sure we'll stay uh, together. <laughs> yeah. uh, but in any case, so that was a kind of the library arrived in Omaha, uh, and we arrived in Omaha. This grant arrived in Omaha, and uh, it was a, you know kind of a a good auspicious beginning. Mm -hmm. And so I remember walking into Ron Roskin's office, and he says to me, Tom. I want you to take international off this campus into the community and educate and internationalize Omaha. And then I want you to bring the community into this campus. You know how Ron was always with this long finger of his, which was very long, and usually with a long cigar on the end of it, telling me, you know, to do this. And I was, you know, impressed by that. So, uh, and Herb Garfinkel and uh, Elaine Hess in on their parts, and John Farr and, and the provost office, they were very supportive of this concept too, Roskins had suggested to them. And then I worked closely with you because sure. there was the connection with the, the, the uh, Center for Afghanistan Study was a, was a unit within uh, College of Arts and Sciences. And then there was this fellow, Orville Menard, who came to me and he said, you know, there are a lot of faculty here who are interested in international studies. We'd like to, you know, put together an international studies faculty and we'd like to get some things going here. And I said, well, that's great. Let's go out and look for some grants. Maybe we could get some grants. Or was uh, assistant dean at that time. I, I know he, he was might for have a been. year in my office. Yeah, he might have been. That's when I had this is when George Thompson, for one year, yeah. George Thompson was assistant dean in, C, uh, in CCS. Yeah. Yeah. And the two of them took me to lunch to, to, to tell right. me that this is what we should be doing. So Orb got together with, with me and then and some others, like uh, Charlie Gildersleeve, Jack Schroeder, Oliver uh, Pollock, I believe, mm -hmm. and, uh, and... Jack Schroeder and Chris uh, Jung had been working together, together on, on the Atlas, uh, on the the Atlas project, Atlas right? Afghanistan. That's right. So they were previous... Jack Schroeder was previously mm -hmm. involved with the Afghanistan stuff. We had, uh, oh, a number of others, Carl Camp and Jung Gun Chung from Political mm -hmm. Science and... And there was also Ert Gum mm -hmm. and Harold in, Dahlstrom in, in from history. history. Yeah, right. And uh, these were the originals, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there was a guy from the Black Studies Department called Hume Sawundla. Mm -hmm. And somebody in sociology uh, named April Putnam. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and George Barger was also a part of this group. And so we all put, you know, our pieces together and we applied and we got a grant from, uh, you know, the Department of what is today the Department of Education, which was then HEW, to develop the, inter the undergraduate dimensions of international education, or the international dimensions of undergraduate education. And as we say, the rest is history, because in that many became ways. A, um, one of the biggest uh, majors in the College of Arts and Sciences. Really, yeah. And today we have, I just got statistics from the college, which said there are 124, as of the 1st of January, there were 124 hard, you know, full-time majors in international studies. Since that time, we've signed up uh, 13 more. Wow. And uh, just in this month of January, 2001, and there are about 35 part-time, you know, uh, majors as well. In other words, individuals well, just, so we, come in. um, just so we don't miss anything, because there's so many things to talk about, let's just sort of tick off the, the different things that are involved with students. We've got the major in That's international right. studies. studies. That has several facets, actually, doesn't it? You can major, you can specialize in area studies of a wide variety, Latin American, East Asian, right. you know, African, whatever. and. Uh, also, you could uh, specialize it's in international management, management and business, component which is a very unique thing. with the business college. That's right. It's one of the very few majors in a College of Arts and Sciences in the United States mm -hmm. 
uh, or a Bachelor yes. of Arts degree that also has the received permission from its college, you know, uh, of business administration to make those classes available in an interdisciplinary major. And that's what really sets this major. Well, it was major a very nice cooperative arrangement. Really was. The Bill Muse. I really. Uh, that's right. Bill Muse is dean then, college. who's now the president of Auburn University, yeah. I believe. He and I worked that out together, and and it's you know it's stuck together ever since. And uh, so most of our majors, 90 percent at least. Uh, specialize in international management business and also do an area studies as well. And then you've also set up a number of sister university arrangements, haven't you, that students get involved? That's right. We began, the first of those was uh, Kabul University, mm -hmm. of course, but then the next one and the one that has been a tremendous uh, success for us, and you've been, been an active yeah. participant in that, uh, Jack, is Shizuoka University. Yeah. You visited it yeah. and you have led study tours for their students yes. here in Nebraska. Uh, just as you have been very active, uh, you were the very first member of the UNO faculty or staff who went to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. No wonder he has me on back this program. That's because you know he's you know he's pay payback, right? <laughs> but anyhow, you went back in '75 together. We won't tell him the stories of sleeping in the lobby of the hotel in Tehran. It's it's that's another story all together, another another tape all together. But anyhow. Uh, Shizuoka University became our second one, and in many ways, it has helped us to set standards for the type of yeah. uh, sister universities. It's in our sister city. Now UNO has sister university relationships in two other sister cities, Braunschweig in Germany with uh, the mm -hmm. Technische Universität uh, Braunschweig, and then Scholle University in Lithuania, and our sister city there, uh, Scholle. And we have others in. In, in Japan with uh, an institution in Hiroshima, several in China, Beijing, and, and uh, well, Shanghai. I don't know what its status is now, but we had one in, uh, in uh, um, Prague, Czechoslovakia. Still have one in Prague and w another Charles one University. In, in, the Czech, in the Czech Republic and, and also in Olomouc, Polotsky University. We have one in Romania, Moldova, Latvia, Tajikistan. And uh, we have them also in Germany and Austria, and, and uh, you know, goes on and on, and, and uh, Mexico and Nicaragua. And all those, those afford opportunities for students and also sometimes for faculty members. A lot of faculty members have gotten going both abroad. ways. They, That's right. They come from the other universities to Omaha. We've often got grants for faculties, mm -hmm. uh, faculty members to participate in exchanges and also the students. Yes. So. I mean, remember for a while there were people coming from. Uh, <coughs> what's now the Czech Republic and teaching Czech classes here for us. That was very that's right. nice for a while. That, those, on, those were on Fulbright grants. Right. And that's right. And then, um, well, let's see, another one I participated in was Nebraska Semester Abroad, and I think that's still going. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. well, and that's a consortium with other That's Nebraska right. We used to go to uh, originally Prague and then Olomouc and Belgium and now it goes to Olomouc in, in the Czech Republic and Thessaloniki in Greece. Greece right. Yeah, right. And uh, another uh, thing that you established not for our undergraduate students so much but for uh, uh, students from other countries was the intensive language uh, UNO program, ILUNO. Yeah, that's the thing after this, you know, the Center for Afghanistan Studies it really became our next major program mm -hmm. and that was this intensive language program and we now average about 150 students at all times taking intensive English language here and at UNO. Do many of those still then after when they finish that? When they, they finish that, students, they, uh, you know, a good, a good percentage of those stay here at UNO and continue their education. Many of them come here and enroll in that with the knowledge that they'll be going onward to UNO once they sure. have achieved the English level that they need to have. Yeah, that was always an interesting program. And then. Um, uh, you have uh, a number of grants, I think, to train um, people from other countries in international management, particularly from third world countries. We have. We, of course, our biggest grants went to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and, and, and numbers of those related to providing support to the Afghan people during the war with the Soviet Union. But we've also had similar you know, development grants in, in Romania, Moldova, Tajikistan, and, and the Philippines even. Mm -hmm. Uh, and all, t uh, you know, all told, t from the time we started out to this, to this day, we've brought in more than 80 million dollars in grants mm -hmm. and contracts and uh, other revenue. Uh, 
I like to point out, and I think it's it's an important thing to do so, that we have uh, some 45 people who work full time for international studies and programs, and with the part timers, we're almost at 70 people who work here. And of that total, of nearly 70 mm -hmm. people, six are funded by the state, and the rest, you know, we raise the money through our revenue generating programs, our grants and contracts, and. And, you know, $80 million is a lot of money to have generated right. in that period of time. It's more than any other unit, uh, and I think most all the other units combined, actually, in that same period. We have just a couple of minutes left. There are two things that I would really like to, to uh, talk about in those uh, remaining two minutes. Uh, one of them is, relates directly to what we've just been talking about, grants and contracts, and that's the... Uh, cross-border uh, educational project in Afghanistan during the Soviet occupation. I think that's an important one, mm -hmm. and I had some involvement with it myself. Um, and the other one is the uh, various positions that you've held with uh, government agencies, with the United Nations, with the, uh, uh, with the United States State Department, and so on. Could you do us, give us 35, 40 seconds on each one of those? <laughs> Well, just to mention that the, about the uh, cross-border education program, this yeah. went from a 86 to 94, and that was a major contract. Major with contract. U.S. agency total for fifty million dollars uh, yeah. by the end, uh, and it was um, all by the end. What we had, had we we provided education in 1,300 sites inside Afghanistan where the Soviet Union was not in control, to 130,000 students. We produced 13 million textbooks, grade school textbooks, K through 12, and 8,800 employees, and all being managed from our office here in Omaha in a uh, in a uh, you know uh, field office in Peshawar, Pakistan, with a sub office as well in in, in Quetta, and uh, we 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 did everything. You know, we helped to develop curriculum, as you know. We trained teachers. We put together. A, a uh, manpower training program, so these are all very yeah, and I interactive. Hope stuff. that in the future, sometime that will pay off. In that, some of these students who were educated may eventually I help so. with uh, help peace develop in peace in Af Afghanistan. Yeah, right. Can we uh, quickly shift because we only have a few seconds left uh -huh. to uh, all of the different things you've done with, for the United Nations and the U.S. State Department? Well, just to say that I, I've been very fortunate as a specialist on Afghanistan to be involved in the negotiations between the United States and the Soviet Union to get the Soviets out of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. and, and we used to meet in Moscow and, and you know, at Washington on these things. The chairman of the Soviet team was Yevgeny Primakov, who later became the Prime Minister of Russia. I worked with Harold Saunders, who was the architect really of the Camp David Accords mm -hmm. and he's been our chairman and then we moved from that into being involved in the peace negotiations and the dialogue now that goes on in the country of Tajikistan and then in 96 97 I was hired by the United Nations on leave from UNO to be the senior political affairs officer for their uh, program or project in in Afghanistan to try and help bring peace there and we haven't even talked Jack about yeah. Beth Saida which is the I Great know, and we've got, I've just got a signal that we have to wrap this up All now. Right. So uh, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, it was, I wish we had time to talk about uh, all the many, many things that uh, we haven't had a chance to talk about yet. So, uh, and I want to thank our audience for joining us today in a visit with Tom Gutierre, Dean of International Studies and Programs here at UN Omaha. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha as seen through the eyes of the history makers. This is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time. <laughs> Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.